I've flown almost all the World War II aircraft, and I rank it as the most formidable aircraft of World War II. This was a lightning-fast airplane. It looks in body form like a shark, swept back wings and the underslung engines. It really uh, looks power, power, power. It had four 30-millimeter cannon, which is a huge punch. Batteries of rockets. I saw an American Marauder aircraft being attacked by an ME-262. One minute there was this beautiful-looking marauder in the sky, a minute later, confetti. I think the two things that made me feel we were in a new age was first flying the jet engine and second flying the swept-back wing. And, of course, the first aeroplane to have this combination was the ME-262. But, of course... The thing that impressed you about the first jets were when you'd been used to piston engine aircraft, you suddenly find yourself sitting in an airplane with the most wonderful view ahead of you because there was no engine sitting there sticking out in front of you. Um, there was this lack of vibration, which you associate with piston engine aircraft, and also, strangely enough, a lack of noise. Although the jet may have been making quite a thunderous noise, it was all well behind the pilot. So you were flying in a comparatively quiet environment, and, um, of course, the, a very speedy environment, too. The thing could really move through the air. It was really quite a revelation after piston engine aircraft. Of course, the other astonishing thing about the transonic era was that Britain and America didn't seem to lock on to the value of the swept wing. Now, we had a group of scientists visit Germany before the war, and they were fully aware of the German research on swept wings. But whether they were sceptical about it, or whether they just neglected to do it, or whether they thought their own method was better, I know not. But the hard fact remains, we virtually neglected the sweet man while the Germans went ahead with it. Not only in research, but in application, as you well know, to operational aircraft. And this resulted in them having, at the end of the war, an aircraft, namely the Messerschmitt 262, that was virtually untouchable. There was nothing in the same league anywhere around operation. The other important way of raising the critical Mach number is by the use of sweepback. To understand this, let's look from above at the flow over a wing. The contour of the wing section determines the amount the air is speeded up. Now, sweep the wing back. We can represent the velocity of the airflow ahead of the wing by an arrow of a certain length. We can consider this velocity is made up of two smaller components. A yellow component at right angles to the leading edge and a red component parallel to the leading edge. The red component can be considered to flow along the span and is not speeded up by the wing section. But the yellow component flows across the section and is speeded up by it. It is therefore only this component which affects the wing's critical Mach number. So the maximum speed reached over the swept wing will be less than it would be over a similar straight wing. In particular, if the flow over the straight wing has reached the speed of sound, at the same flight speed, the flow over the swept wing will still be subsonic. The swept wing has, therefore, a higher M crit. In many ways, I think we ought to be thankful that the Germans produced this very late in the war, and then when they did, Hitler made a terribly bad decision when he decided that 
he needed fighter bombers rather than fighters at this stage, so he relegated the Messerschmitt 262 basically to being a fighter bomber. So its potential as a fighter wasn't exploited till virtually the war was won. If it had come as it could have come easily, um, because the research was very well uh, advanced in Germany, if it had come a year earlier, it could well, in my opinion, have turned the outcome of the war. The war in the air, maybe not in the long run, the eventual war, because you can always overwhelm another country with sheer weight of numbers, of course. But the war in the air would have taken, I think, a very, very different turn it did. And uh, we'd have been faced with very heavy losses and maybe a considerable prolongation of the outcome of the war. But up to a point, luck was on our side. Of course, when the war actually ended in 1945, because I was German-speaking, I was whistled over to Germany, literally two or three days before the actual war ended, to move in behind our troops as they overran airfields and pick up as many German aircraft as possible or which were of particular interest to us, experimental aircraft or advanced aircraft, fly them back to Farnborough for assessment. And, of course, the war finished um, not many weeks after this, and uh, we were able then to sit back and test these thoroughly. And it was quite a shock in many ways to find out that in some areas, they were at least five years ahead of us. Particularly in the area of high-speed flight with um, swept back wings, in rocket flight, and in jet flight. Now, when I was at Farnborough, we had a top-secret flight there of jet aircraft, so I was fortunate enough to fly the very first jet this country ever produced. And um, the ones that we subsequently produced and also America's very first jet. And we were able to assess them all. And the Germans were ahead of Americans and ourselves at this stage. Which was quite a remarkable effort when you consider how Germany was slowly but surely being bombed, or had been slowly but surely bombed into a state of almost utter ruin, and that their country was doomed to be overrun by our troops eventually, and by the Russians, of course, and the Americans. So it was a truly remarkable effort. Now, the ME-262 was, in my opinion, I stated this many times, the most formidable aircraft of World War II. When you consider that at the end of the war, the top Allied fighter was the Spitfire Mark 14 with a top speed of 446 miles an hour. When we tested the Messerschmitt 262, it had a top speed of 568 miles an hour. This was a quantum jump in performance, and it meant the 262 was virtually inviolate. You have to realize it was like talking about football. You have the first division, the second division, and the third division. It's much the same in aircraft. Nowadays, you have a Premier League, which is something extra right above. The only aircraft in that league was the ME-262. It was really a formidable aeroplane, very fast, heavily armed, and um, it was so fast that nothing could really get near it. The odd one was shot down, but when? On either takeoff or landing, when it was slowing down, with the only weakness, of course, was the fact that its engines had a very short life, which, as I told you, 25-hour scrap life. So the engines were very temperamental. It also handled 
quite well in the air. It had no nasty characteristics, really, except if you lost an engine on takeoff uh, before you reached safety speed. But apart from that, I was very impressed. It had two shortcomings, but all the early jets did in our country, in America, and in Germany. Firstly, the engines were very sensitive. They were slow to accelerate to throttle movement, and you had to handle them very carefully to avoid flaming them out. Secondly, we hadn't thought, or the designers hadn't thought, of how to slow down these incredibly fast airplanes. And no air brakes were fitted. And this made life very difficult, for example, for the landing. You need some drag if you're going to land. And um, since there was very little drag associated with the 262, you had to do a long, slow approach to landing. And this was a, a, an Achilles heel because the 8th USAF Mustang has realized this, and the few 262s they picked off was usually in that phase of the operation. Aircraft designed to fly near the speed of sound use thin wings together with sweepback to obtain a high critical Mach number. Various arrangements have been adopted, all very different in appearance. The greater the sweep back, the more the critical Mach number is raised. For instance, suppose the straight wing has a critical Mach number of 0.8. By sweeping the wing back to 35 degrees, the M crit is raised to 0.98. But this is only the theoretical result for an infinitely long wing. In practice, the critical Mach number would only be raised to about 0.9. Sweep back, like thin wings, brings its own problems at low speed, such as tip stalling. So designers must compromise between high speed and low speed requirements. Fundamentally, they had some brilliant, brilliant men in this business, in, as aerodynamicists, brilliant designers, and they had gone along certain paths <coughs> which we knew about, which we knew about, but elected not to go along. For example, swept wings were described by German aerodynamicists at a, an open meeting in Italy in 1937. There were many British <coughs> representatives there, but we didn't believe, presumably, what we heard, because we didn't follow it up. On the jet engine side, <coughs> you had another situation. There is no question that Sir Frank Whittle was the first man to invent the practical jet engine. But we didn't seize on it as rapidly as the Germans did, because Pabst von Ohen, who was Frank Whittle's equivalent in Germany, freely acknowledges that he learned his fundamental knowledge about the jet engine from the Frank Whittle work. But they then developed it more rapidly because the, the government backed him, whereas in this country Whittle was without the backing he should have had. As a result, the Germans went into the path of building axial flow engines which today, every jet in the world almost is axial flow, whereas the British went along the centrifugal flow line. Um, I've talked this over with Sir Frank, and of course the reasons he, we went this way are very sound, because at that stage in the war, the centrifugal flow engine was much more reliable than the axial flow. 
In the German engines had a total scrap life of 25 hours, which is quite ridiculous. So there was that to be said for it, that we had more reliable engines, but in the end, the axial flow is the way to go if you wish to develop the engine to its ultimate. Now the Germans, in spite of making these wonderful aerodynamic advances, just didn't have the time to do too much flight testing in the transonic region. They just pushed on as hard as they could, threw the thing into production and into combat, uh, literally within months of it having been tested in some cases. For example, the Arado 234, which was a startlingly good um, fighter bomber, was put into production and was very, very successful, extremely fast for its time. And when we interrogated the chief test pilot of the Arado company after the war, he had done virtually no transonic testing on this beast. It was quite unbelievable. Um, what little had been done, we advanced on that very quickly at Farmer. Within a matter of months, we had done more than they had. And um, another example, of course, is the Heinkel 162, the little Volkswagen. Uh, this uh, was thrown into combat, very fast airplane, almost as fast as the message with 262, but thrown into combat because of the complete panic situation in Germany, virtually without any advanced flight testing at all. So we were left with a very interesting phase at the end of the war where we knew the potential of the German aircraft was far higher than ours, but we had no data, real data, on their testing for the simple reason it hadn't been done. So we were launched into our own testing program on this, and this really was a very illuminating and <laughs> quite exciting time. Um, it is true that the ME262 um, eventually had an injection seat, and um, but not in the original case. I mean, not ever, by no means had every um, 262 an injection seat. In fact, I think there were very, very few that did. Um, 163 didn't have it at all. The Arada 234 didn't have it. Um, the Heinkel 162 did. It, I think it was really the first one that had the full production line, had ejection seats right from the word go. So you see, the whole thing was very, very much delayed. And then on this side of the water, on the British and American side, there were no ejection seats at all in the transonic era. Um, the Meteor at that stage didn't have an ejection seat. Um, Vampire certainly didn't. And even our little research aircraft, the um, DH-108, was without. So you had a situation where we were doing what might be called the unknown area of um, aerodynamics, one of the very, very much unknown areas at that time, and yet had the minimum escape facilities available. I think this is what really, the combination of the two is what really made it hazardous. Mm. That's why I think a lot of lives were lost. A lot of lives could have been saved with ejection seats, but they just weren't there. They have not been really invented or perfected. But there's no doubt about it that toll in life was high um, in the experimental research world. And it spread up to a point into the operational world, too, because, as I've remarked, many of these aircraft were thrown into the operational arena without really having been fully tested in the transonic region. It's particularly true of the German aircraft, of course. And uh, there are many, many cases of um, recorded cases of operational pilots in the heat of battle exceeding the speed whereby they, the trim change put them out of control.